Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Meet the Professor. This is the day we talk about the management of multiple myeloma with Dr. Nupur Rajay from the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Harvard Medical School in Boston. We have a great faculty for this series, and uh, this is actually the last program in this series. And later on, we'll show you the results of a survey we did of the faculty of their usual treatment practices. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room. We'll talk about as many of these as we have time. Uh, we put out a very brief one-minute pre- and post-meeting survey. If you take it, you'll get a lot more out of the uh, webinar, and we'll learn a little bit more about you. We know a lot of people end up listening uh, to these webinars. Uh, hi out there to everybody on the road and on the beach, etc. If you're into uh, podcasts, check out our Oncology Today series, including a recent program on BCMA-directed therapy with Dr. Krishnan. Uh, next, we're doing webinars all the time. Uh, next week, uh, we're starting a new series on ER positive triple negative breast cancer with Dr. Javari, basically everything other than HER2. And then on Wednesday, uh, we'll be continuing our year in review series with a program on lymphoma with a great uh, faculty. Then on Thursday, February 2nd, we're going to be doing a program on adverse events seen with BTK inhibitors. Uh, that should be very interesting, uh, both in CLL and mantle cell, of course, so important. Uh, and then uh, we have a real special program on February the 8th. Uh, uh, the role of ovarian suppression in the management of breast cancer. You have two great faculty members, Dr. Kathy Miller, Dr. Ann Partridge, uh, talking about that. We'll be then heading out to the uh, ASCO GU Symposium. We'll be doing uh, several satellites out there. If you're in the San Francisco area, come on over. If not, check it out online. Uh, the first program on Wednesday, February 15th, on renal cell cancer, the next day on prostate cancer, and finally, urothelial bladder cancer. Great faculties for all these. Today, we're here to talk about multiple myeloma with Dr. Rajay. And as always, we have a bunch of docs uh, from practice. We're going to be presenting uh, cases uh, for Dr. Rajay uh, to react to. Here's where we're heading. We're going to start out with a few papers, then we'll get into cases, then we'll show you some of the survey, more cases, and then more journal club. So Newport, I've got to tell you, though, uh, last night, uh, Turns out we were doing a webinar with your next door neighbor there, Dr. Laurie Worth on thyroid cancer. And she said she saw that we're doing a she saw we're doing a program with you tonight. She said she's going to photobomb you and come in through the door behind you and wave, I, you know, just I love it. She has an office right next to me. <laughs> that's awesome. I, that's, I know that's what she's telling. Me. I don't think she's actually going to do it, but I thought that was pretty amusing. It must be really amazing uh, up there with all, your, all the great faculty. Anyhow, uh, let's go through a few papers just to sort of get warmed up. Uh, for a couple of papers related to CAR-T, we'll get into the nitty gritty of CAR-T. These are some things that are sort of on the edge that I thought were just would be interesting to the audience that I found. Uh, so the first uh, paper, editorial, leaving lytic lesions. Is there a new role for radiation and multiple myeloma in the CAR-T era? Uh, is the abscopal effect back? Is this like the abscopal thing? Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts? Yeah, so this editorial is really addressing the episcopal effect of uh, radiation. And the thought here, we're going to be doing a study, Neil, so we don't have the data as yet, but we're going to identify a target lesion prior to the CAR T cells. We're going to give that target lesion radiation, and then we're going to look to see if those T cells home to that area, again, addressing this issue of this episcopal effect. So I do think there may be a role for radiation to make the CAR T cells work better. We just have to prove that in the context of myeloma. I always like to ask them. I'll ask the uh, audience, too, in the chat room. Have you ever seen a patient that you really thought you saw you know, what essentially was the abscopal effect in general? Not just CAR-T, but any immune therapy? Somebody in the chat room just said yes. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen it occasionally, you know, and that's why we want to do it in a more... Uh, we want to do it rigorously and really study it. So a case here and there, we've seen it. I've given radiation to a patient getting a BCMA CAR T cell. We've seen amazing responses. We didn't necessarily biopsy those uh, patients, but that's the plan with the, a future trial, which we will be doing. So this is another paper that sort of caught my eye from the last ASH meeting in December. You don't hear too much about checkpoint inhibitors uh, 
outside of Hodgkin and hemologic cancers. I'm always still waiting for them to sort of come in there. Uh, but this was an interesting idea of using nivolumab uh, salvage therapy uh, in patients who relapse after CAR-T. What's the thinking behind this and what did you report? Yeah, so again, we did it in a few patients. It didn't work in everybody, Neil. And again, I do think, uh, you know, uh, checkpoint inhibitors is going to be specific to a patient. But if you have exhaustion markers on those T cells, we were able to restore responses in a couple of patients, albeit for a short period of time. So really using drugs like checkpoint inhibitors in the setting of novel immunotherapies may be seeing a comeback in myeloma in specific patients patients where you have uh, exhaustion markers increased using drugs like either nivolumab or any of the other checkpoint inhibitors would be something one should be thinking about doing. So that'll be interesting to follow. So you've uh, had a real leadership role over the years in uh, management of bone disease and myeloma, and we actually haven't talked about, we're so tied up with the bispecifics and CAR-T and all the other new things going on in myeloma. We don't talk about that, this that much, but still so relevant. This is a great uh, review article that you did. I really recommend uh, for people to check out uh, reviewing the whole issue of bone disease. Anything you want to say? I mean, one of the big issues here is the difference between denosumab and zoledronic acid. You want to comment first on how, sort of how you v view the microenvironment and how that ties into what you see clinically? Yeah, so really important, and this doesn't go away. Bone disease, as you all know, is pathognomic, and this cartoon just highlights the different cell types, osteoclasts, osteoblasts, and the big difference between denosumab and zoledronic acid is denosumab is a rank ligand inhibitor, so a monoclonal antibody which is reversible, whereas zoledronic acid directly targets those osteoclasts and inhibits them, and it sticks around in the bones forever. So the one thing which I think we forget about, we're seeing less bone disease at the time of presentation in our patients with myeloma, but given that our patients are living so much longer now, Neil, what I end up seeing is more bone disease and bone-related complications at relapse and multiple relapses, and that's why treating bone disease is critically important in patients with myeloma. Where do we stand today about treating people who don't have bone disease? Yeah, that's a great question. And I always say if your patient requires, if your patient meets criteria to treat myeloma so that if they have symptomatic multiple myeloma, I almost always will use a bone targeted agent because they will have some dysfunction in their bone microenvironment and correcting that is going to be critically important. And I think the MRC9 trial, which is now several years old, did teach us that because they did take everybody with or without bone disease. And what they showed very nicely in that trial, Neil, was even if you did not have lytic bone disease on x-rays, if you were on the zoledronic acid, you actually saw a decreased incidence of bony disease decreased incidence of osteolytic disease. So I would suggest that everybody who has symptomatic multiple myeloma requiring treatment should be on a bone targeted agent. Incidentally, Charles in the chat room said he's absolutely seen uh, the upscopal effect in a CLL patient. Thoy in the chat room is asking about duration of bone targeted therapy. Yes, again, a great question. And, you know, most of the data we have with clinical trials is about two years. But in my mind, again, the risk of bone disease does not stop at two years. I do think after a patient is in remission, one can back off and almost treat bone disease like osteoporosis, so less frequent dosing of the bone targeted agent. But at least in my practice, what I do do is continue the bone targeted agent. And I think this is really important specifically if you're using a drug like zoledronic acid, for example, just stopping zoledronic acid, uh, not zoledronic acid, denosumab, for example, you cannot just stop denosumab because it's a reversible uh, uh, monoclonal antibody. You might actually increase the incidence of vertebral compression fractures as has been seen in the osteoporotic community. So you have to continue a bone targeted agent. You can do it less frequently and that's fine, but don't stop it. So uh, this is one of a number of uh, uh, 
graphics in your paper comparing denosumab to zoledronic acid. What's the bottom line? This was uh, another one. This is a study that you actually did, a phase three study that compared uh, the two. Um, what's the bottom line of what we know about the comparative impact of these two strategies? Yeah, so when we did the large randomized trial, uh, the intent was an equivalent study. We were showing that denosumab was just as good as zoledronic acid. And when it came to skeletal-related events, we were able to demonstrate that. What was interesting was this other second paper that we did subsequent to that, where we looked at the progression-free survival. And honestly, I've never seen a better PFS in any treatment-related trial for myeloma, we saw a PFS benefit of about 10 and a half months in patients who got denosumab versus zoledronic acid. And when we drilled a little bit deeper into that data, what we found was patients who were intended to receive a uh, hydroschemotherapy stem cell transplant, they did better. And the other really important thing with denosumab was it was renal protective. So it did demonstrate improved anti-tumor activity as well as renal preservation, which are two big factors for the control of myeloma-related bone disease. Another kind of related pa uh, paper that I saw that you did and relates to one of them, we're going to get into a case where a patient presented with a calcium of 17, <clears throat> and I noticed this letter to the editor where you uh, also look at the same comparison related to hypercalcemia. What did you find or what did you say there? Yeah, so denosumab is obviously more potent as an anti-resorptive and it works better for uh, hypercalcemia. It is one of the only drugs which is actually FDA approved for the treatment of malignant hypercalcemia from uh, cancer-related bone disease. Uh, we did see that in this trial as well. Um, so the choice should be denosumab. The only word of caution is, uh, you know, you can become hypocalcemic. So these patients need to be monitored carefully. Specifically, if they have renal dysfunction, you might end up with reverse hypocalcemia. But our preferred drug for hypercalcemia is denosumab. We're going to start going through some cases here. We're going to start out with this 80-year-old uh, patient of Dr. Vishwandathan. Actually, I just noticed uh, she's in the chat room. So before uh, she presents the case, I just want to ask you a question about the case, uh, Newport, because, uh, you know, one of our interests has been in people who are new to oncology, uh, you know, people who weren't, you know, in practice when we didn't have bias, but when we didn't have CAR T, when we didn't have diratuma, all that, which is only like about five years ago, really. Uh, so here's my question. You know, you've just gone into practice. You're in rural west of Virginia. Uh, you've been called to see a patient in the hospital, an 80 year old man who's presenting with a creatinine of seven and multiple myeloma. But the patient is the father of one of the nurses in your office. So before we actually get into the case, any advice, again, particularly to people who are sort of coming new to the field about the issue of taking care of colleagues, uh, taking care of colleagues, family members, et cetera, any words of wisdom, Newport? Yeah, no, we, you know, what we do for our patients, patients are like family. Obviously, this is a patient of a colleague of yours. Uh, I, I don't think I treat anybody any differently, but you just have to uh, try and make, I, I would do what I would do for my father in this case, right? And uh, the good news is we have uh, uh, good treatments available, but really, holding that patient's hand, and not just the patient's hand, but the daughter in this case, who is your colleague, is going to be uh, critical in making such a big difference to the outcome of this patient. I think being a physician, uh, whether it's uh, 10 years uh, uh, from now or even before, I think it still remains the same. Really deeply caring for those patients makes all the difference. All right, well, let's get into the clinical science of this situation of an older patient. It sounds like he, the patient was in good condition in general, but still 80 years old, standard risk disease, and a creatinine of seven. Here's the case. A very, very pleasant 80-year-old male. He's the father of one of my nurses who got admitted to the hospital with anemia, hypercalcemia, renal failure, does have history of diabetes and CKD. So what would our experts be thinking in terms of treatment for this elderly gentleman who presented with renal failure? 
I decided to initiate treatment with Cyborg D and I added Dalatumumab. You know, he's tolerated treatment well so far. He did have some diarrhea with bortezomib and nausea, which we've been able to control. And he currently is in BGPR after four cycles. We've thankfully avoided dialysis and his creatinine is now close to his baseline. So how would they be thinking of maintenance strategy for him? He is a very independent, functional gentleman, very pleasant. His daughter takes him for his appointments, but otherwise at home, he's functional. And if you talk to him, he's the one of the person who wants to do everything possible. So any thoughts about, uh, first of all, the approach to older patients, 80 year old in good condition, is transplant an option? I'm curious about your thoughts about transplant, incidentally, since the determination paper. But let's just start out with your general approach to patients who present like this with renal failure. Yeah, so uh, kidney failure, I think the key is absolutely start treatment as soon as possible. I think hydrating a patient is cr absolutely critical. Using a bortezomib uh, containing regimen is critical. Uh, you know, using cytoxan with bortezomib would be perfectly reasonable for somebody with renal failure. I would suggest using deratumumab early in people with renal failure. And in fact, using just deratumumab with bortezomib uh, can really improve kidney function quite significantly. Um, the other thing I would suggest is, you know, if this person's creatinine turns around, there is no reason why this patient cannot be on an IMID, especially, uh, you know, it's early days when your creatinine is seven, you do not want to give lenalidomide. But after that, you can certainly give this patient Revlimid specifically once the creatinine comes down. Uh, so after a couple of cycles of cyborg D, I think putting the patient on RVD, dose-adjusted lenalidomide to the creatinine and continuing the deratumumab is what I would suggest doing. In terms of maintenance, uh, you know, I didn't hear about what the risk factors were from a genetic standpoint, uh, Neil. If they're completely standard risk, uh, then just continuing um, uh, deratumumab with bortezomib for at least eight cycles and then continuing with dera, I would certainly uh, consider adding lenalidomide so he could be on len maintenance alone. So uh, uh, what about the issue of transplant? Of course, every one of our programs, we ask people what they think about that now that we've seen the determination data with a PFS advantage, but without a survival benefit. I'm just curious what your thoughts are about, of course, Dr. Richardson down the road from you at Dana-Farber actually presented the data. I don't, I still hear people, you know, docs and practitioners say, I'm still sending them to the transplant doc to have them be evaluated. Investigators seem to be saying they still are interested and maybe more with a higher risk. But honestly, I was kind of, I don't know, bothered by this lack of survival benefit, but any thoughts? Yeah, but you know, I think the important thing to remember is the very significant PFS benefit. It's close to 18 months. We've never seen that uh, PFS benefit. I wouldn't worry too much about the survival benefits. So I do think transplant is the uh, standard of care. Not so much in an 80-year-old. I would not worry about a transplant in this patient. I would not refer this patient for a transplant because if for an 80-year-old, it's not that he's not going to be able to tolerate the high-dose chemotherapy. It's just the residual effect of the Melflan on his stem cells and his counts is going to be just too much for way little benefit. So I certainly would not be transplanting people about the age of 75, uh, certainly not this patient when he has so many other options of treatment. So actually, uh, Dr. Vishwan, and Vish, I got maybe we'll call her Dr. V, but anyhow, she wants to know whether you, she's in the chat room, whether you think uh, DARA lenalidomide is the maintenance therapy the patient should be on. Yeah, no, I, if no high-risk features at all, uh, I would absolutely continue DARA. I would continue the DARA for at least two years if possible and then keep on uh, lenalidomide maintenance uh, so that they don't have to stay on bortezomib. Uh, if they do have high-risk features, genetic high-risk features, I would consider using bortezomib maintenance in this patient. In the patient without renal failure who's not a transplant candidate, how do you approach these patients? You've always been a champion of the RBD light regimen in these patients, 
But of course, the DARA RD regimen is probably the most common regimen being used right now. Uh, how do you approach these patients? Yeah, so, you know, I am still using RVD, but I use it with daratumumab. So RVD light with daratumumab is extremely well tolerated. And as long as the patient is fit, even if they're elderly, I think the goal is the same. Uh, trying to get them into a nice deep uh, remission is the critical piece here, and we've seen that there are RVDs extremely well tolerated as long as it's given every week subcutaneously and don't continue it forever. Um, patients do quite well. So speaking of Dara RVD, uh, we have a case of a younger patient with Dr. Warren Brenner, a 67-year-old man. Here's the case. I have a patient, 67, who was found to have a sternal mass and was diagnosed with stage 1 IgG kappa myeloma. The patient wanted the best therapy that we could offer him. He was very well read, very well educated, and ultimately we decided to treat him with RVD plus daratumumab. The patient had a very good response, but still has minimal residual disease based on bone marrow. The patient declined moving forward with transplant at this point, although his stem cells have been collected. The question for the clinical investigators is, if this patient was staying on maintenance therapy, would you recommend they just receive lenalidomide, or is there a role to combine lenalidomide with daratumumab? And if so, do you use it for a defined length of treatment, or do you treat them indefinitely until progression? And I'll add in there just to begin, like which regimen you <clears throat> actually use, and do you add dar? I see investigators doing that all the time. And yet, I'm still looking for the phase three trial. Is that, I don't know if that's coming, but anyhow, what are your thoughts about both adding DARA as well as this question about maintenance? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, the jury shifted towards uh, quadruplets already, Neil. I think most of us would use a quadruplet. There's ongoing trials looking at triplet versus quadruplet, and I can only imagine that the quadruplet is going to look better. Uh, there are RVD in this patient is a very reasonable treatment uh, uh, approach. I would have probably used the same uh, myself. How does one maintain? So this patient is still MRD positive, doesn't mean much. I would continue uh, the patient on treatment. If they finish their stipulated cycles of the DARA RVD, uh, your question on maintenance again goes to what their risk uh, factors are from a genetic standpoint. If they're standard risk, then continuing with lenalidomide maintenance and DARA is what I would suggest doing. Um, DARA typically, now I take uh, this from the Griffin trial, DARA was continued for about 24 months there, and that's what I would suggest doing. If they have high-risk features, what we've done is Revlimid maintenance with DARA for up to two years at least, and Bortezomib every other week as maintenance. So you already said Revlimid twice, so that's $10 fine, you know, $5 every time you say a trade name. Just kidding. Oh, no. <laughs> the myeloma people, the myeloma people cannot do that, but anyhow, give it a shot. Anyhow, speaking of high risk, uh, Dr. Lee has a 62-year-old man with a T414 and 1Q21 uh, addition. Uh, here's Dr. Lee uh, asking for some uh, input on this case. This is a 62-year-old gentleman, um, history of type 2 diabetes with some mild peripheral neuropathy. And the patient presented to his primary care doctor with a three-month history of progressively worsening low back pain. Myeloma evaluation did demonstrate an IgA lambda M protein of 4.4 grams per deciliter, and the patient did have a elevated lambda free light chain relative to the free kappa light chain. PET CT did show an FDG avidel 3 epidural lesion, also showed multifocal bone lesions suggestive of myeloma, and so the patient underwent a bone marrow biopsy and it did demonstrate 70% lambda-restricted clonal plasma cells. The myeloma fish panel was notable for translocation 414 and 1Q21 amplification with four copies of 1Q21. And so, you know, I think the main question is how would we approach treatment for a patient such as this who has newly diagnosed high-risk multiple myeloma? 
And just to refer again, the audience to this great paper that you did from the uh, ASCO education session on high risk. Uh, any thoughts about the case? And then maybe you can talk a little bit about the paper. Yeah, so, you know, this patient clearly has high-risk disease. couple of high-risk uh, features that the patient has in addition to the genetics, so they have the 1Q amplification and they have the 414 uh, translocation. So genetically high-risk, but in addition to that, lots of bone disease, and the patient also seems to have some epidural disease, so a little bit of extra medullary um, extension of their myeloma as well. Um, so this patient, I would consider a quadruplet. Um, you know, uh, again, you're going to get differing opinions on what that quadruplet would be, but a young, fit patient, we prefer to use a carfilzomib-containing regimen, so KRD with uh, a CD38 uh, monoclonal antibody is what we are using at Mass General, so KRD, deratumumab, is what we would consider doing, and the use of KRD is largely based on the Forte trial. So if you remember the Forte trial, the Forte trial was KRD with transplant or KRD without transplant versus KCD. And the reason I picked that trial was that trial actually really enriched for the high risk, genetically high risk patient population. And the addition of K seemed to do really um, well for this high risk patient population. So the critical piece here is give your best treatment upfront to this high-risk patient population, trying to get them into an MRD negative state and maintaining them in that state is critically important. And for that reason, uh, using the combination of KRD with a CD38 monoclonal antibody would be my choice of treatment for this patient population. So we had another case, but we don't. Uh, I decided not to present it because I had another case from the same doc. But of a of a patient who got car, carfilzomib, a, a KRD, rip roaring heart failure, no prior history of heart disease. They worked them up A to Z, amyloid, nothing else. Only thing they could ascribe to was the carfilzomib. Have you seen that? So, yes, with carfilzomib, you can have issues around fluid retention. You can have hypertension. I do think they are manageable, though, and I think it's really important to, um, you know, in those cases, dose-reduce carfilzomib, give the carfilzomib carefully, and really not necessarily give the prehydration, which is specified in the label of carfilzomib. So less hydration, use of diuretics, control of hypertension and giving the carfilzomib slowly and then ramping up the dose slowly is a better way of giving carfilzomib. So getting back to your paper, any comments uh, on this uh, really interesting graphic about proposed modification to the uh, ISS? Yeah, so, you know, when you look at the revised ISS also uh, for the national staging system, we typically look at disease burden, which is how we've come up with the international staging system, and we focus heavily on genetics. But there's a bunch of subpopulations which are ignored in that uh, classification, and that includes some of the patients which have already been presented, like patients with renal failure are not included in this mix. The other piece which is sort of forgotten about is those patients with extramedullary disease. And as we are doing better imaging, such as PET scans, etc., we are actually picking up more patients with these extramedullary disease, and they behave very differently from what you see or what you capture in that revised ISS staging system. So as we learn more about myeloma and as we learn more about how these patients behave differently, I think we are going to not just look at genetics. We're going to look at features such as comorbidities, renal failure specifically, bone disease, and also look at frailty in terms of what can a patient tolerate versus not. So uh, this is another interesting graphic looking at high risk based on transplant eligibility. Anything you want to say about it? I noticed there you have consolidation in the transplant arm. Is that what you typically do? So, you know, consolidation, transplant in itself is considered the, the consolidation. And I think that 
that we consider as consolidation, adding in more treatment after the transplant, such as a few more cycles of whatever your triplet or your quadruplet is, is also trying to get to an even playing field. Uh, but outside of that, you know, the consolidation is a little bit of a misnomer in my mind as long as you get four to six cycles of good induction treatment do you need to give anything at the back end of the transplant is uh uh it's debatable i think so the chat room's heating up a little bit here dillop wants you to cite data showing carfilzomib is superior to bortezomib <laughs> Very good question. And I do, you know, I think with the only data which has compared carfilzomib to uh, bortezomib is the Endeavor trial. And the Endeavor trial was a trial not necessarily in the patient population where it should be, should have been done. Um, so this was in a transplant deferred patient population. And what was shown out there was DR, uh, RVD and KRD were equivalent in terms of efficacy. What they found was that KRD was a little more toxic. But remember, this was a transplant deferred patient population. That's not where we're using carfilzomib. So I think there is really no head-to-head -head comparison outside of the Endeavor trial of bortezomib versus carfilzomib. But when you think about proteasome inhibitors and you think about the efficacy of proteasome inhibitors, carfilzomib seems to be the most potent of all uh, proteasome inhibitors. It's an irreversible proteasome inhibitor, and it's effic uh, it seems to be most efficacious. Again, I have no data for head-to-head -head comparisons. All right, 60-second case from Uzoma, 80-year-old with relapsed myeloma in second CR with Dara KD, now on Dara maintenance, and remains in CR two-plus years. How long do you continue the DARA? Stop at two years indefinitely until progression. Any thoughts? Oh, wow, good question. No, no data. So no data saying that you stop because at the time of relapse, once you continue, we keep going with the DARA as long as they're able to tolerate it. I will say, though, that once we've looked at more of the upfront data, uh, you know, stopping after two years or so seems reasonable because just continuing, um, I, I don't know what the benefit of that is. But unfortunately, we have no data in that space. And the uh, default is continue until progression. I would consider stopping, though. All right, let's go to another case. Uh, this is a young patient, 37 years old, uh, who gets uh, RVD. This is sort of the pre dara days, which weren't that long ago, but uh, got RVD transplant, has been on maintenance lend for three and a half years, doing great. I don't have to tell you what her question is. Here's Dr. Ma. Uh, young patient, 37 years old, and he had a routine at the time, RVD induction, auto transplant, did really well. And so ever since then, being kept on but a little mite maintenance. So my struggle with these patients are two sides. You know, we always told we can't cure myeloma patients. He's doing so well, back to work. You know, I hesitate to stop maintenance. He's doing well, but there is a concern with secondary malignancy on then a little mite. So will anybody stop? Is it five years? Do we have a timeline what everybody think for this maintenance treatment. I'm also curious now is the MRD testing getting more and more prevalent just in malignant him in general. You know, for this patient, would the MRD status affect decision making? Is that sufficient data to tell us if MRD is negative, we can stop? You probably get asked that like what, five times a day? <laughs> yeah, uh, see, these are these are fantastic questions, and unfortunately, we don't have great answers. So, as far as LEN maintenance is concerned, uh, you know, LEN maintenance continue up until progression. Um, I don't think we know whether or not we can stop maintenance lenalidomide, but that's a question which is being asked, and this is exactly what you're showing up here, wherein MRD testing may be helpful in uh, allowing us to figure this out. I just want to highlight one other piece that you mentioned in your case, which was the second cancers. Yes, there is a risk 
for second cancers with lenalidomide, but that risk of second cancers is extremely low. And if you take into account the risk of progression from myeloma versus the risk of the second cancers, you know, the risk of progression from myeloma far outweighs the risk of that second cancer. So most of us would say, continue with LEN maintenance up until progression. Now, the big question is, can you consider stopping LEN maintenance and can you use a tool such as MRD in helping us decide whether or not we can stop that? So, as of right now, I'm going to say that data is early. We do not have clinical trial data where we can say that stopping after X number of uh, years of LEN maintenance is okay. There are ongoing trials. There's the dramatic trial, which is asking exactly the same question, wherein we are doing MRD at different time points. And after seeing MRD sure negativity or sustained MRD negativity, we are stopping treatment and then following patients. We're going to have to wait on that data. It's going to take three or four years. If your patient, however, has significant toxicity from lenalidomide, whether it's counts, whether it's GI-related toxicity, then using MRD in practice as a one-off case is reasonable, telling them that really not I mean, using MRD, and it's better to be MRD negative before you stop as opposed to being MRD positive and considering stopping in this patient. So I would do it in a one-off case where I'm struggling with a patient continuing and then doing that MRD test. I will sometimes stop lenalidomide maintenance. So speaking of second cancers, uh, a couple weeks ago, we were doing a program on AML with Dr. Richard Stone from your down the road there, Dana-Farber. And I was asking him, because, you know, we're talking about the determination trial. And one of the things that struck me, and I'm thinking a lot of other people, is there were 10 cases of AML in the transplant group and zero in the non-transplant group. And I was asking him about it. I said, do you see, you know, a lot of AML after just autologous transplant? And he said, no. And he said, maybe this is an interaction with the lenalidomide. So any thoughts about that? And any thoughts, again, getting back to the termination trial? Any, how do you feel about the AML I issue? Yeah, that's, that's a real issue. And, you know, with the uh, high-dose chemotherapy, so with Melflan, there is a risk of MDS. And that risk is about 3% or so. And then add on the lenalidomide maintenance, we may be increasing that risk even more. Nikhil uh, Monshi from Dana-Farber recently presented data also in patients who got high-dose melflan where they had a really high mutational burden and genetic instability post-high-dose melflan. So you may be doing things with chemotherapy which really disrupts the genome and predisposes you to all of these genetic abnormalities and things like second cancers. So certainly a concern, but at the same time, you can argue with the 18-month PFS benefit. Um, so, you know, this is something one has to think through, talk with patients about. The risk of second cancers and leukemia is real, and that risk is compounded in people who are getting a transplant. So getting back to MRD and this paper you wrote, I think, you know, both uh, myeloma, also CLL, it seems like more and more trials are building MRD into it. Uh, this is a graphic you put out there about some of the trial ideas that are going on using MRD. Uh, can you elaborate? Yeah, so, you know, as of right now, we have MRD as a test, and I think we have plenty of data which has shown that MRD is of prognostic significance. So I don't think anybody can argue about that. And the way I think about MRD now in the day of uh, all of the novel drugs that we have and all of the quadruplets that we are using is that MRD is our new complete response. In the old days, we used CR. Now we use MRD. And the deeper your response, the better you're going to do. Now, how can we take MRD to the next phase is what we are showing in this cartoon out here. And once we can start using MRD to tailor therapy, for example, that's where we're going to be able to make a difference. And what do we mean by tail 
triggering therapy? When can we stop treatment? When can we de-escalate treatment? Which was the question which was asked by the previous speaker earlier on. Can I stop lenalidomide maintenance? We don't have data just as yet, but I think as some of these trial ideas mature, we will be able to say, especially when we're using four drug regimens, you know, we should be able to use fixed duration of treatment. We have come up with a definition of a sustained MRD negativity, which is two MRD tests one year apart. And if you have sustained MRD negativity, can we do away with some treatment? There has been a trial, you know about the MASTER trial, which was a good trial beginning to ask these questions the way they defined MRD negativity was MRD show off just for 12 weeks was not good enough. So we need to follow these patients long enough, but we may be able to identify patients where for the first time we're going to say, okay, we're going to be able to stop treatment in a subset of patients. And that's going to be a huge benefit to our patients where we, the paradigm in myeloma has always been continuous therapy and we're going to be able to question that paradigm with this MRD tool going forward. All right, next case, a 66-year-old quad refractory patient with a history of multiple prior infections. Uh, now we start to pick up the pace here as we move into what's new in myeloma. Here's Dr. Morgenstein. 66-year-old female quad refractory She's asymptomatic. This patient's had numerous serious infectious issues. She actually was diagnosed with listeria meningitis and recovered from it. She's had multiple bouts with pneumonias requiring hospitalization, and she's currently on IVIG. She has progressive disease, and we just started her on Selenexor and Carfilzomib, and she's being evaluated and set up for CAR T-cells as we speak. So in this patient who is quad refractory, heavily pretreated, what is the role of Selenexor? How should we manage the GI toxicities? Should it always be given in combination? And when it's given in combination, particularly with a proteasome inhibitor, which would be the best proteasome inhibitor to give it with? Any questions about bispecifics? My question is, where is the optimal place for these medications to be given? Is this something that's gonna be given in the community? May they be given in the academic center first and then come back into the community? So these are new class of drugs that seem incredibly effective. And then with bispecifics, what is the ultimate role of CAR-T therapy gonna be? I've had numerous people try to go for CAR-T and it's much more cumbersome as getting the collection and ultimately getting the medications. And sometimes people progress fairly quickly on this. So you can probably spend two or three hours on that uh, quest series of questions. Let's just start out with Selenexor. Uh, do you use the drug? You know, we're, we've lost a couple of drugs that were available. We'll get to that in a second in the relapse setting, but Selenexor is still there. Do you use it? And what's your experience with it? Yeah, so, you know, Serenex or I, I do use it occasionally, not necessarily all the time. And typically I've used it more to bridge somebody the way uh, Dr. Morgenstein is using it to bridge towards CAR T-cell. I typically will use it in combination depending on how aggressive the disease relapses. You could either combine it with a bortezomib or with carfilzomib. I will always use it on a weekly schedule, so never twice a week. And, you know, if you're using it in combination, the beauty of uh, using Selenex or in combination is you can drop the dose. So you do not have to use 100 megs. And I've never, in fact, used 100. I've typically gone to 60 or 80 when I'm combining with a proteasome inhibitor. I do think it's really for the GI toxicity, um, you know, making sure that the patient gets uh, good antiemetic uh, therapy and hydration. And typically, if you're going to see GI related effects, you're going to see it in the first couple of weeks or so. And uh, by combining it with something else, the benefit of that is reducing the dose of Selenexor. And by doing so, you're reducing the toxicity, the GI toxicity as well. In general, you know, I have not necessarily kept people on Selenex or too long because, as I mentioned, I've used it more as a bridge. Uh, but managing this GI toxicity is critically important for patients. Um, there's a whole lot of I, other questions. And 
By specifics, there's a question right in and of itself. So we've got one available. And one, of course, one of the big questions everybody's asking is, uh, Dr. Morgenstein brought up is, can it be done in the community? Um, right now, they have to go into the hospital. I mean, really, it's tertiary care to start with. What do you see happening? I mean, it seems like a lot of people would potentially benefit from these drugs. Well, how do you see this playing out over the next year or two? Is it going to be given in the community? Yeah, what's your vision? Yeah, no, I think, you know, what we have with the bispecifics is very active drugs. They are off the shelf. And one of the things which Dr. Morgenstein mentioned is really important for all of us to understand and appreciate. If your patient is progressing rapidly, then things like CAR T cells become less accessible and available because there is that little bit of time wherein you have to manufacture the CAR T cells and get them to patients. This is where I do think bispecifics are going to be critically important. As of right now, you know that teclistamab was approved just uh, uh, late last year. When it was approved, we've started using teclistamab in our hospital, uh, but it does require hospitalization, and we are hospitalizing patients for that first one week. Uh, we do have to have drugs like tocilizumab available to our patients, uh, and we are actually using tocilizumab, and if you look at most of the clinical trials with these bispecifics, about 30 or 40 percent of patients did require the use of tocilizumab. So I don't think it's something which can be used in the community right away, at least the first couple of doses, the priming dose and the step-up dose is going to happen at centers which are used to using some of these other supportive care strategies. I do, uh, you know, there was an ASH uh, abstract presented by Suzanne Trudell where she used uh, uh, Sevostimab, and Sevostimab is a bispecific uh, uh, directed against FCRH5D, and what they did out there was use prophylactic tocilizumab. So I do think we are looking at ways to try and transition to using these bispecifics completely outpatient. We're not quite there as yet. So the hope and the vision for the future is that it should be able to be used outpatient. We need to do a little more work on uh, trying to identify the best patients that we can do it. But up until then, the first few doses I do think are going to happen at transplant centers or CAR T cell centers or academic centers before it goes out into the community. A lot of the subtleties of, you know, clinical trials are very hard to just, you know, sort of figure out in terms of how it actually plays out. A lot of times I end up asking questions like this, which is, you know, I've heard, you know, cases and we've, you know, we talk to patients who are just bored to death and we get CAR-T, they come in the hospital, they have nothing to do because they're totally fine. And I imagine there are quite a few patients, probably more, who get bispecifics who come in and have zero problems. But roughly, what fraction of people are you? I mean, that doesn't mean you, can't, you don't need to put them in the hospital because you don't know who they are. But globally, what fraction of patients will cruise through CAR-T and cruise through you know, initial treatment with bispecifics? So, you know, I do think so as the CAR T cells have gotten approved, uh, Neil, we've been able to do CAR T cells a little bit earlier. We're not doing it in patients who have like very bulky disease. And when we see that, we are seeing less in terms of toxicity. I do think the same thing is going to happen with bispecifics as well. As of right now, who's getting bispecifics? Patients who have absolutely no other option, who have very high disease burden. And those are the patients where you will end up seeing troubles with. So as of right now, as soon as it's gotten approved, the worst of the worst actually end up getting these drugs. So early on, when this becomes available to patients, we're going to see a little more toxicity. As people become more uh, familiar with the use of it, we'll start using it a little bit earlier. We'll start using it in a little more controlled setting, and we're going to see less in terms of toxicity. For toxicity, I think we have to try and manage disease burden. We shouldn't be seeing rapidly proliferative disease. And and those are the patients where we're going to see less toxicity. The other thing I think which is going to happen 
over the next uh, you know year or so is it's going to be incumbent upon us to try and identify biomarkers of who are the ones who are going to develop all of these toxicities and who are the ones who absolutely need to be hospitalized. And that's going to be based on cytokines, based on T-cell function, based on tumor burden in patients. And once we have that data, I think we're going to be in a better place as to figuring out who can be safely treated outpatient versus inpatient. You know, the way things are right now, I think people are happy just that they get a slot with any CAR-T, but we do have two approved products, and I am curious uh, how you indirectly would compare both efficacy and tolerability of those two. Yeah, so, you know, as far as tolerability, I think both of them are pretty well tolerated. Um, That's the good news in myeloma. Uh, We've seen a little more neurotoxicity with one of them, delayed neurotoxicity with Siltacel. As far as efficacy is concerned, I think very different, right? The uh, Idacel data you've seen, uh, we've seen uh, toxicity uh, or we've seen efficacy in about uh, uh, CR rates of about 40% and we've seen uh, remission duration of close to about a little over a year. If you achieve a CR, it's about two years. With Siltacel, the response rates is way higher. And if you look at follow-up in these patients at two years, we are seeing about 65% of these patients without evidence of disease. So the two products are clearly different. One's efficacy is much higher, but that same Siltacel's efficacy is also balanced by the neurotoxicity, which has been seen at least in the CARTITUDE 1 trial. Any reason to think that CAR-T would be less effective if you get a bispecific first? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I personally think yes, because if you think about the mechanism of how bispecifics work, you know, you're constantly engaging the bispecific, you're going to cause some level of T-cell exhaustion. Now, after you've exposed a patient to a bispecific, are you going to be able to get enough T-cells to generate good quality cars is something we don't know. So if I had a choice... And if you ask me how would you sequence some of these, my suggestion would be do the CAR T cell first and do the bispecific after. So I used to say, is it okay to use belantamab before CAR T? But of course, belantamab has been pulled off the market as well as melflufan. Any thoughts about that? I hear people saying they think that, uh, you know, we have, we've heard of cases of people responding, you know, to, uh, uh, Belantamab. We had one case for patient who was been on it for four years. It's amazing to think that you have a drug like that that gets pulled off the market. Any thoughts about the future of these two agents? Yeah, I think be- Belamav specifically. So Belantamab, uh, You know, I I do hope it comes back. Uh, it is a good target. It's something which we've uh, used as bridging therapy for CAR T cells. Unlike uh, a bispecific, Belamaf can certainly be used because it is an ADC, so it does not impact the T-cell function, and you can certainly use it in these immunotherapeutic strategies. So I was a little surprised uh, when you have several ongoing phase three trials, uh, not for uh, toxicity. This uh, It just did not meet sort of the a statistical endpoint that Bellamaf was pulled from the market. So we'll see whether it comes back. My sense is it probably will because of the ongoing phase three trial. Melflufen, I'm not so sure. You know, melflufen is like melflan. Will it add to um, any uh, thing in terms of what we already have available with cytoxin melflan is a little bit unclear to me. Um, so uh, I'm not holding my breath for melflufen, but Bellamaf, uh, I do think there is a potential chance of it coming back. So I want to go through a few of the questions we asked the faculty. Uh, um, we had a question in the chat room about using ezotuximab after daratumumab. Uh, but we asked the faculty, are they using sub-Q DARA? Everybody says yes, but at, ASK, at uh, ASH, we saw a sub-Q formulation of ezotuximab. It looks pretty interesting. Any thoughts about that? And do you think that uh, we'll be in a situation where either one of these could be used sub-Q? Because I guess that's the one differentiating factor right now. 
Yeah, no, I think once Isotuximab gets its subcutaneous version, it's going to become very competitive with Deratumumab. And if you remember, when you know, the data they presented with the Isotuximab, they have this device which can just be slapped onto the uh, belly of the patient. It can be self-administered. Whether or not we will get there as yet, uh, I don't know. But this goes to trying to give drugs at home. So ESA has a nice device which allows Isotuximab to be delivered and I think that's something worth pursuing and it then will be very competitive with deratumumab. Yeah, the device is really cool looking. Uh, so again, the question in the chat room is, what about using ESA after DARA? And everybody either has already done it or they would do it. You say you would do it for the right patient. So what's the right patient? So the right patient is it? they should not be deratumumab refractory right? Because it's the same CD38 monoclonal antibody. And if you've just had deratumumab before, going to esotuximab right after, you're not going to see any efficacy with esotuximab. If they've had a specific uh, duration of uh, interval between deratumumab and then the disease comes back again, certainly more than six months. Six months would be the least amount of time I would use. I would consider using esotuximab. The other place where I don't mind using ESA if I'm combining it with carfilzomib, so I am going to be giving something intravenously. I do not mind giving IV ESA. Otherwise, it becomes hard to justify the use of an intravenous monoclonal antibody when you have something which is available subcutaneously. Yeah, that's a really good point. I keep waiting for uh, Laurie Worth to pop out behind you uh, <laughs> from in her office next door. We were talking about Selenexer before. We asked people when they use it or if they use it. Uh, people <clears throat> use it anywhere from third to fifth line. Uh, and uh, bortezomib, we saw some good data at, uh, at ASH on that combined with bortez uh, carfilzomib, which was used in the patients. Any comment on venetoclax? It's hard to find a case of T1114 and out there in the community. I'm sure you see it quite a bit, so we didn't present one today. Uh, but can you comment a little bit about venetoclax? Is it, do you only use it in T1114 or people have uh, high levels? And what line therapy? Most people are saying second line. Dr. Fonseca would like to be able to use it first line. Uh, any thoughts about uh, venetoclax? Uh, most people are thinking about in combination uh, when not too much side effects of other and people talk a little bit about GI effects. So any comments on venetoclax? Yeah, no, if a patient has 1114 translocation, absolutely reach out to venetoclax. I generally will use it second line because most of these patients have had RVD, rev maintenance, um, uh, would typically use it in combination, a protosome inhibitor, um, and extremely well tolerated. And I've had patients stay on venetoclax for years. So the earlier you use it in that specific population, the better. I don't go by the BCL2 expression because it's hard to get. Uh, there's no real test. So just going by 1114, um, uh, if they have that translocation, use it. The one word of caution with those 1114 translocated, uh, you know, the outcome of patients who have additional translocations or P53 deletions and mutations is going to be different. If they have more of a complex uh, gen genotype, they're not necessarily going to respond just as well as opposed to patients who have isolated 1114 translocations. So I want to see if I can squeeze in two real quick cases of complications of proteasome inhibitors, beginning with a case from Dr. Gupta. I'm struggling with this patient, 74-year-old woman. She had excellent performance status at that time. So we started on standard dose of lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone. Within two, three months of starting the treatment, she developed severe neuropathy predominantly in the right hand and had a hand drop. I've never seen anything, only three months. This patient has no underlying diabetes, no nothing. I send her to a neurologist, EMG was done, and she had significant sensory motor axonal peripheral neuropathy. They did a whole workup, everything was negative. She became so debilitated with her neuropathy that she became wheelchair bound. I remember she saying, I can't even write a check. 
So I stopped everything. Her husband just passed away from hepatocellular cancer. So she doesn't have any social support. Going for any appointments is a problem. Her performance status is an ECOG of three because of neuropathy. She's wheelchair bound. If she continues to progress and we have to think of another line of treatment for her myeloma, what would be the optimal choice for her? Anybody has any thoughts like, you know, what else could be going on for the neuropathy that we did not think of? Any thoughts? Yeah, this is obviously very challenging, uh, Neil, and I will tell you, I've just come from clinic. I'm still in my coat, and I had a very similar patient and developed this acute neuropathy, of, which was happened literally overnight. She's wheelchair bound. Very difficult cases to treat. Uh, I think holding the bortezomib is exactly what needs to happen. Doing as much supportive care as possible is critical here. And these are the patients where I would consider other drugs like deratumumab, uh, lenalidomide, lower doses, and carfilzomib. Uh, you know, I typically use carfilzomib weekly, and if they're an older patient population, I will do the 27, go up to 36, but once a week. And these patients do, if their disease requires uh, any treatment, these are the non-neuropathy-containing treatments that I would consider using. So, uh, Newport, thank you so much uh, for working with us today. Special thanks to all the docs who uh, presented cases. We've been working with hundreds of physicians in the community since the pandemic began. I'm so appreciative of their willingness to, you know, put their cases and their treatment right out in front of everybody. Uh, but it's really so helpful to us. Thank you for attending, audience. Great chat room tonight. A lot of really great input. Uh, we're going to be coming back uh, next uh, week. And, hey, you know, her too low and D uh, TDXD and... Uh, the choice of CDK inhibitors, not only in metastatic disease, but also in the upfront, et cetera, et cetera. Surge, so much going on. Finally, in ER positive uh, breast cancer. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Newport. Thanks. Thanks so much, Neil. Thank you.